Hello, everyone. I'm your host, Steve Zerker. This is our twice monthly program called Looking to the East. Thank you very much for uh, tuning in. We have a very special show on tap for you all today. Uh, since we are coming to the end of the year, I decided to assemble our, our usual cast of characters, although we do have a new guest today, uh, to take a look at what has gone on in Japan over the last year. So this is a, a roundup show taking a look at uh, political economic trends that uh, we think are interesting to talk about in Japan, and then also talking about Japan's continuing relationships with its neighbors, uh, China, and then also the very important relationship between Japan and the United States. So we have Paul Scott with us. Paul, thank you so much for attending. Paul's former professor at Kansai Gaidai and now is a professor at the Catholic School of Lille, I think. Did I say that correctly, Paul? Catholic University of Lille, that's correct. Very good. So thank you for attending. And we have uh, Jiri Mastecki, who uh, also has a Kansai Gaidai connection in that he is a graduate of the Asian Studies program, currently a partner at uh, Kitahama Law in Osaka. So thank you, Jiri, for attending. Appreciate it. Hello. Thank you. You're welcome. And our new guest uh, today is Taro Tsuda. Taro is a professor, history professor, assistant assist uh, professor at Kansai Gaida University. Uh, so I thought it'd be interesting to have his perspective since he studies uh, modern history of Japan and also is uh, following, paying attention to the current political trends in Japan and so forth. So let's get started. I, let's talk about uh, what we consider to be the major um, factors, major events that occurred in Japan over the last uh, year in 2022. Uh, obviously, COVID uh, is something not, not just Japan, but worldwide uh, countries have been struggling with. Uh, it's interesting to me that Japan continues, unfortunately, to be the leading country in terms of the infection rate, I checked before the show started, and Japan over the last few days has uh, had over 100,000 infections. Looks like it's gone down a little bit maybe uh, today in the reports that are coming in so far down in the 60,000 range. So it considers to be a factor here, but not one that seems to be materially influencing or changing behavior. Um, you know, everything seems to be running as per normal, even though these numbers are so high compared to the early days of COVID. You guys all remember <clears throat> when we just had 3,000 infections, you know, the country was shutting wow. down. Any any comments or observations about uh, how Japan is handling COVID? Yeah, I, I might say one thing, which is that I, I agree with you that, Steve, that you know, we're cu coming out of COVID or trying to come out of COVID here in Japan, just like the rest of the world. But, you know, Japan's baseline is a little bit different than than other countries as far as COVID protection. So I was just in in, in Europe and in Europe, no one wears masks, uh, very little social distancing. Um, it's it's almost as if as if COVID hasn't hasn't really happened. Um, Japan, however, it's a completely different reality. Um, people here still wear masks. There are still social distancing uh, policies. You have to be careful in restaurants. There are still, uh, you know, uh, plexiglass partitions uh, in in where, wherever you go. So, yeah, you know, I I think um, you know the the measures here are are very different. But but despite that, I think that we're having you know t tourism is 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 coming back. It's ninety, uh, you know, at least in the Osaka area. Or the Kansai area, it's ninety percent uh, of 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 uh, pre-COVID, so that's some good economic news. So you know, look, I I think Japan is dealing with it, uh, but there haven't been a lot of changes as far as people's behavior. But that that behavior has been much more uh, careful uh, than than in other countries where you know, pretty much the uh, precautions have been disregarded in a lot of. Yeah, if I had more hair to pull out of my head, uh, I would. And uh, but what's always annoyed me uh, uh, is is uh, the media, uh, and NHK does this all the time, and Japanese news does this all the time. It's almost the first news story. It's the infection rate, but the real story should be the death rate, mm -hmm. and the death rate and the mortality rate, and uh, uh, is extremely low. And that's why here in Europe, with a death rate of 0.01%, uh, 
uh, people are are basically uh, Jerry is completely right. Um, people aren't even taking um, uh, the uh, the fourth uh, the fourth uh, uh, vaccination. Um, mm. uh, the government is not saying COVID is over, uh, but uh, but psychologically and um, behaviorally, uh, people are uh, are tired of it. Um, and if I can make one more point. Uh, um, uh, Stephen, you may be interested that Hewlett Packard bought a, a company called Poly uh, for $3.3 billion mm -hmm. uh, just a couple of months ago. And Poly um, uh, focuses in on um, distance, on um, not on uh, working at home, uh, mm -hmm. audio and visual. And that is really interesting uh, mm -hmm. that uh, has Japan changed its work habits? Uh, are people... Uh, uh, yeah. Still having to go to the office or obligated to go to the office, and mm -hmm. um, uh, that certainly has has changed in the United States. Uh, I think fundamentally, mm -hmm. uh, but in Japan, I'd let uh, the people living in Japan answer that. I, I would say no, uh, or not mm -hmm. yet. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, Paro, do you have any uh, perspective on this? Uh, we're we're teaching now in person at Kansai Gaidai. Mm -hmm. And even though the numbers are high, uh, there's no chance of interruption of that. There's no possibility of us going to online education again. But all the students wear masks in the classroom. All the professors wear masks in the classroom. Uh, my sports club just changed their policy. This is Konami, guys, you know, the, the Japanese famous one. And they no longer require masks in, in the gym now. And guess what? 100% of the Japanese people in the in the gym are still wearing masks. It doesn't make any difference that the, the company has said no more. It's not necessary. Um, everyone is still wearing masks. I was quite surprised to see that. Yeah, Sorry. I just had a I just had a class yesterday that focused on um, the pandemic and East Asia. And then at the end of the class, I asked the students, like, what do you think of Japan's how Japan has been handling it, have people been behaving responsibly? And then they said that they think people have been behaving responsibly, but maybe a little bit too cautious. They wish they could take off their masks like people in uh, Europe and in the U.S. So I found that interesting, but I thought, yeah, so yeah. people are following all the precautions, but they're not necessarily doing so completely out of their own um what they would you do otherwise so it's maybe social pressure mostly Absolutely. yeah that's that's what i would conclude as well very interesting aspect of japanese culture all right guys well let's move on to what i think to be uh, the, one of the major stories and i've done a couple shows on this already and that has to do uh with the uh, abe assassination of course that was a, a huge shock to the country that alone but then there was a subsequent scandal, I guess I would call it, as to the motivation of the person who killed Abe, having to do with uh, Abe's connection to the Unification Church. And then it kind of spun out from that to the incredible number of connections between the ruling party, the LDP, and other parties in Japan between their organizations and the Unification Church. I think the initial strategy on the part of the LDP was to just hope this story would go away, but it hasn't. It's been a remarkably powerful story. So what are your <clears throat> observations or comments uh, about that? Maybe I can start with you, Jiri, on this time. You've been watching right. this. It's really interesting, isn't it? I thought this would go away like so many scandals do in this country, but this one has yeah. not. No, it hasn't. Uh, but the issue of the unification church and politics in Japan generally is not really a new issue here in Japan, right? I mean, the unification church has been around, uh, you know, for you know decades, uh, mm -hmm. and the issue of the unification church has been around for decades, and people giving their money to the unification church has been around for decades. This is, you know, it, it hasn't been as much in the forefront. Uh, until the the assassination really sort of brought it, you know, back uh, into people's consciousness. So I think it just reflects an ongoing, um, well, issue uh, of of government, you know, interaction and and you know, uh, 
Um, it's not that much unlike, at least you know, from the American perspective, it's not unlike, you know, people talk about, for example, the, the involvement of evangelicals or the evangelical church influencing mm -hmm. politics. And, you know, in that vein, nonetheless, um, it, the assassination um, really, really brought it, brought this issue to the fore again. At the same time, what I would say, and I, look, I, as an American, I, again, again, we tend to put things in our own cultural context. Um, you know, I, what, when I was here, I thought, okay, well, this assassination is going to be like a JFK moment of deep reflection and, you know, mm -hmm. sh you know, shock to the, to, to the, you know, the Japanese psyche. It, it really hasn't been. Uh, I mean, it hasn't yeah. been, it hasn't been this huge sort of, you know, uh, a reckoning of what's wrong with our society, you know, how, where, where have we got, it, 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 it hasn't resulted in that. So that for mm -hmm. me was a little bit, you know, um, I, I, I thought it would actually have more impact, um, but it, it hasn't. And those are just, just my thoughts. Yeah, I, I agree with you that the story now, I mean, obviously uh, Abe is remembered and uh, the Jiminto party will uh, have like memorial type of activity, but the bigger story for the last, what, at least three or four months now has been this connection with the Unification Church. That's what's on the daily television programs. I don't know how many times I've seen Jiminto politicians in in the diet uh kind of confessing, you know, I, I'm, I'm a Catholic, well, a, a lapsed Catholic. Yeah. It was like, I, they're, they're admitting that they met on these days and they received this money. It's been almost like a ritual. Yeah. One, like, one other, one other point. I mean, that I also found a, a little bit uh, uh, surprising was that when they had the, the, you know, they decided to do a state funeral for former prime minister Abe. And there were actually people who were saying, well, he doesn't deserve one. You know, mm -hmm. why are we, you know, there, there was sort of a, there was sort of a controversy as to whether or not, you know, this, the sort of the state funeral w was even warranted for, for Abe, which, you know, again, uh, was uh, an, an interesting debate to, to observe. Yeah. yeah Tara, what's your, what is your perspective on this? This is um, on quite the, an interesting phenomenon for us foreigners to look at. On the Unification Church uh, issue, I found it very interesting. There was an article in the um, Japan Times which talked about how uh, the unique structure of the electoral system and how campaigns work makes it susces susceptible, susceptible for this kind of involvement. So mm. it's not something really that new. And as as we discussed, and um, I don't think it would be a decisive factor in any big political change, but it might fuel um, lower approval ratings and uh, more discontent with the political system. So yeah. I don't think it would be decisive, but it might contribute to. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Tara, for providing a, a bridge for me uh, to the next topic, and that is uh, Kishida's who is Japan's prime minister, is continuing low popularity, in part because of this unification issue, uh, among other uh, challenges that he's faced, uh, economic as well, the weakening of the yen. So, Paul, I know you watch this very carefully. Um, is Kushida going to last? There, He seems to be under criticism now by his own party, those that are uh, more in the Abe camp or the more conservative part of the LDP. Well, elections are on schedule to 2025. Yeah. Uh, Japan. So I think uh, he, I, I imagine he will last unless there's another scandal or another shock, which is not, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, impossible. Uh, the problem, of course, is is a problem for for most economies, all economies that were affected by COVID is. Uh, Money was borrowed, and countries are in debt. And you know, Japan has is two hundred and sixty six percent of GDP uh, mm -hmm. in debt, the highest of any developed uh, country or developing country. Mm -hmm. And how are you going to pay it? And uh, this is a mm -hmm. tax uh, tax problem. Mm -hmm. And I know from the two thousand twenty two budget that uh, let me remember that uh, Japan uh, that Kishida had to supplement six hundred and sixty billion yen uh, to prop up uh, social security. 
So taxes, and they're not going to raise the consumption tax uh, mm. now. Uh, mm. But I think they're going to raise the corporate tax. Um, they're not going to. I don't think they're going to raise income tax um, because that affects everyone. Mm -hmm. um, but um, how? Uh, same in France. Uh, the same in Britain. The same in the United States. More and more in debt. Um, mm -hmm. This is uh, this is the most. Uh, a Serbic type of policy within a uh, you know who, who uh, within any uh, political party who do you tax and how much and what's fair, mm -hmm. uh, right? You know. Yeah, in the news in the last week or so, um, the prospect of increased taxes um, in order to fund the dramatic increase in defense spending. That's right. That uh, maybe it's a legacy of, of Abe's leadership and so forth because he was very uh, supportive of growing the military. And the budgets uh, now are proposed budgets for the defense spending for, on the part of the government are, are being doubled. And the question to, to your point, Paul, is who's going to pay for that? How is that going to be paid for? Is it going to be corporate taxes or personal taxes? And all of this uncertainty and the, and the prospect of taxes, I think, is helping to keep Kashida's uh, ratings and the ratings of his cabinet quite low. But as I recall, they're, they're somewhere in the 30 percent range now, which is very, very low. Yeah, I think there's a minister of economic security in, in Japanese politics, and he has come out uh, um, against uh, a tax increase. So that's a very public thing to say uh, mm. inside the government. Baro, have you been following this issue as well? Um, yeah, I, I think that's maybe the, the most recent development that the this um, proposal to increase the defense budget and um, the debate about how to how to pay for it as you said so yeah i think that will be a very difficult choice for um the government to make and but i think there are other so there's the influence of former prime minister abe and his faction but there are also the recent um international events in east asia that have fueled um this so china oh, you, you you once again have provided a segue for me so thank you you're you're really turning out to be a wonderful guest, helping me to move from topic to topic. So obviously, the increase in defense spending is as a result of the tensions in uh, East Asia, primarily with China and the rest of the region. So there does seem to be some uh, reaching out on the part of the Kashida government to uh, have a rapprochement between Japan and China. But uh, the fact that Japan is raising its defense spending, of course, is not going to make China very happy. And I, I don't know. I haven't seen anything specifically from China on that, but I'm sure they're going to be quite critical and bring back the the, the uh, specter of World War II and all of those uh, those those days. But Jerry, I know you're interested in this this topic quite a bit. You had suggested that we talk about it. Do you have any insights uh, as to how J the Japan China? relationship will evolve now that Japan is taking a much more aggressive uh, position when it comes to spending on military. Right. Well, you know, the issue for China is that, first of all, China, because of COVID, uh, because of the increased militarism, because of their perceived uh, support uh, for for Russia vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Ukraine war, China's image uh, right now among at least the the sort of democratic world uh, is is at a low. And uh, you've also had developments within China, again, sort of the, the reshuffling, the consolidation by uh, Premier Xi of his power. Um, it, and, you know, the, the lingering issues that were going on before COVID, including the, you know, the artificial islands, uh, you know, the claims about the South China Sea, those really haven't subsided. And you know the, the fear is if is if you don't have efforts by the Japanese government, by the U.S. government, by other Asian countries, we're going to be entering into uh, a cold war uh, here in 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 East Asia, which will be very unfortunate, I think, for 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 everybody here. And I, I think a good thing in Asia is that most most of the players here realize that, and so hopefully there will be efforts you know uh, again in, which will also in, you know include the united states uh to try to um i don't know dial back 
or uh, again, I, I, I guess the word rapprochement is, is probably the best word to, to, to try to uh, lessen tensions so that we don't, uh, you know, slide back into a, you know, uh, a Cold War mentality, at least, you know, vis-a-vis -vis China. Russia is a completely different uh, animal, I think. I, I don't, the relationship that the world is going to have with Russia uh, after the Ukraine war is is going to be uh, very different, possibly even much worse than than with the Soviet Union during uh, uh, the Cold War. So we'll see. Mm -hmm. Those are my thoughts. Mm, OK, you know, you know, Stephen, if I could add that, uh, you know, maybe over the top top 10 stories of 2022, it's it's, of course, number one is Ukraine, um, mm -hmm. I would imagine. But it would be the um, the fragility of the supply of the of the supply chain, mm -hmm. and um, uh, who who would who could possibly um, survive a um, a Chinese uh, atta attack invasion uh, of of Taiwan? What would that mm -hmm. do to supply chains? Mm -hmm. And um, uh, who China is more fragile? I think. Um, uh, in that regard, um, um, uh, I don't want to, you know, maybe than than Japan, but even in 2022, look at the inflation and the cost of um, the cost of food in Japan. That's a, that's um uh -huh. I think that's on on the top of our list. Yeah, is, I I agree with you, Paul. It's uh, I think it's more dramatic in in the states because the numbers are in the seven to eight percent range, but it's. As a consumer, you know, as someone who goes to the grocery store or Costco or wherever I go, I've noticed that the prices have significantly increased and uh, incomes are not increasing in Japan. So uh, and that's true. Uh, also, in the United States, I was reading you know, prices are going up and incomes are, are stable or actually trending down. So that could create more political tension and then lead to uh, greater criticism or uh, unpopularity of the Kushida government at this point. Taro, do you, are, have you noticed the prices uh, in the local stores in Hirakata going up as well? I certainly see that in Kobe. Yeah, definitely things like um, vegetables and cheese. I think it's cheese especially. The <laughs> price seems to be, have been gone going up a lot. And um, in terms of in terms of China, I think there are two like contradictory um, influences. One is the Ukraine, as we discussed, the Ukraine-Russia war is um, increasing tensions in East Asia and between the U.S.-Japan side and the China side. But on the other hand, it seems like domestic influences in both China and uh, Japan seem to encourage a better economic relationship between China and Japan. So it's hard to tell which way it will actually go. Right. Yeah, Japan is always caught between their economic interests and their number one trading partner, which is China and has been for many years, and the political realities uh, that occur and Japan's uh, strong alliance uh, with the United States and kind of being most of the time lockstep with the United States on its political positions and so forth. So I found it interesting how the most recent meeting between Kishida and Xi was so mm -hmm. positive amid all this other, all the other stuff that's going on. So maybe that's because of the economic interests between the two countries, but. All right, uh, we're running out of time. We just have a few more minutes left, but the last thing I wanted to talk about is Japan's relationship with the United States, uh, which of course continues to, to be quite strong. I'm wondering if any of you have a perspective on the recent midterm elections and the fact that the Democrats uh, were able to exceed expectations and hold hold the Senate barely, uh, unfortunately lo lost the House. Um, so that does seem to provide the context for a consistency between Japan and the United States in terms of uh, foreign policy. And Biden is is still he's no he's uh, he's not considered lame duck because he's some I don't know if he's responsible, but he is being attributed to, uh, as being part of the reason why the Democrats did well in the midterms. So I think that adds a sense of stability. Uh, perhaps do you guys agree with that perspective that the midterms are actually helpful in terms of maintaining a positive Japan-US relationship going forward, at least for the next couple of years or so? I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, either the Democrats will have learned, 
either both sides will have learned something from this election, either neither side will learn something from this election, or it'll mm. be one or the other. And I think there's a lot to be learned uh, when we go to 2024. Mm -hmm. And uh, I read a poll that now Democrats uh, think, 71% of Democrats think that uh, Biden will win in 2024. And wow. I'm, not sure that's, I'm not sure if that's the correct message from this midterm. Mm -hmm. And um, um, the country, I think, from what I've read, wants neither Trump uh, or Biden to run in 2024. But that's not in the hands of the American. That's uh, that's in the hands of... of, uh, of um, other forces, I would say. Yeah, the political machinery and so forth and party. Yeah, I mean, the contrast would be Biden against Trump. And we've talked about this before. And uh, I think the general perspective is that under Trump, although there was a strong relationship between Abe and, and Trump during his period, but there was a lot of instability and a kind of chaos. And now uh, Biden, although maybe not quite as and inspiring as you'd like him to be, at least it seems stable. One factor is our ambassador, Rahm Emanuel. So I'm hearing through, uh, Jerry, you're probably hearing this too. Right. APCJ contacts, they love him. Sure. I, have, I have people telling me that he's been the best ambassador over the last you know 30 years or so. So, Well, uh, yeah, as, as, as a former uh, uh, Chicagoan, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Ambassador Emanuel is the... Uh, uh, former mayor of Chicago, he has a reputation uh, for getting things done. He's not an ideologue and he is, uh, you know, he, he's, a, he's, he's very practical and he focuses on, on the task at hand as opposed to, again, all of these ideological uh, arguments that, that Democrats and Republicans like to focus on. Yeah. Taro, any, any observations on the U.S.-Japan relationship uh, given the election results in in the United States, and also the fact that Kishida's popularity perhaps uh, is so low. Yeah, I think um, for now the status quo is is maintained, and I think even though um, Prime Minister Kishida's approval ratings go is declining, I think it's still not in the danger zone. So, especially mm -hmm. in terms of foreign policy, the the status quo will be maintained for for the foreseeable future, as I can see it. So. All right. Well, I, we're out of time, but I, I have to, you know, I remember the McLaughlin report, right? He always ended with predictions. <laughs> so we don't have time to go into any detailed predictions, but uh, do you feel that uh, 2023 will be on balance a positive year? Is, do I get a thumbs up or a thumbs down in terms of your sense of what's going to happen over the next year or so? Paul, why don't I start with you? Uh, it's, it's, it has to be a resolution of Ukraine. Of course, uh, uh, and then other dominoes fall from that, mm -hmm. and whether or not uh, 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 she, she, you know, genius is knowing when to stop, um, and uh, uh, the uh, and China has to understand its its limitations. It's mismanaging its economy, mismanaged mm -hmm. COVID. Uh, mm -hmm. Twenty percent uh, people are predicting that the Chinese GDP will go down in two thousand twenty three. Wow, that'll be it's shocking. All man that's man-made uh, because yeah. of poor policies, poor policies here in, in Europe as well. Um, mm. So um, it may get better. <laughs> <laughs> very, very uh, di diplomatic response, Paul, yeah, yeah, yeah. as I would expect. <laughs> How about you, Jerry? Can you be more, more definitive? <laughs> you're you're well, look, in the I, law firm. I, I, I I think on, I think on the COVID front, I think on the COVID front, things will get better. I think countries will start to open up. I think travel will start, uh, you know, to come back to to what we 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 think of as is normal. So on on the COVID front, yes, I I do see a positive outlook. On the economic and political, uh, I would have to uh, agree with uh, Professor Scott that that it's going to really depend on what happens. Uh, both with the Ukraine war as well as with, with China. And that mm -hmm. is to be determined. All right, Tara, I'm turning you to you as my last uh, hope for a, a strong, positive response. <laughs> What's your I, view on next year? I think, the, I think the current trends will generally continue. So um, neither huge improvements nor huge um, backsliding, but... Um, I agree that what's going on in China is one of the most important, one of the most interesting things, 
all the tough decisions that um, she has to make about um, COVID policy as well as um, the the Ukraine situation. So, and you and Japan relations with Japan. So, um, mm. I'm really looking at that, and also if there are any big developments in the war between Russia and Ukraine. So, mm -hmm. um, but I hope right. things will continue stably. All right. Okay, we'll need to leave it at that. Thank you very much, guys, for participating. This has been fun. Really appreciate your perspectives, your opinions about this. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much for our viewers for tuning in. Really appreciate it and look forward to another episode of Looking to the East in the Future. All right, that's a wrap. Thank you very much, guys. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.